These curves leading away from the station towards Yeovil Junction are the most recent tracks I've laid on my 2mm fine scale model of Yeovil Town. I wanted to super elevate them and before I dismantled the boards to wire them up I thought I'd lash up some temporary jumper wires and do a quick video to see the effects. So the videos are a bit rough and ready, I'm afraid. Um, a word about the prototype. Super elevation or cant was applied to all running line curves where speeds were above about 10 miles an hour, mainly because it reduced rail and flange wear. It wasn't just done for creature comfort. Similarly, transition curves didn't just ease the horizontal centrifugal forces but allowed the passage from straight track on the flat to the cant of a curve to be smooth and progressive and within the springing capabilities of the locomotives and stock. How much the outer rail was raised above the inner was determined by the maximum speed and the radius of curvature at that point. The double track here is XLSWR and I have used the tables produced by their engineer's office in 1903 as my reference. Cant was applied above speeds of 10 miles an hour and to radii greater than 6 chains. That equates to about 80 centimetres or 2 foot 7 inch radius in 2 millimetre scale. So super elevation was pretty universal on all curved running lines which perhaps makes it surprising that you don't see it modelled more often than it is. On the model here, the track transitions up to about a 5 foot radius briefly as it leaves the station, then 6 foot through the crossovers here, and then when it gets onto the plane track after them, up to about 8 foot for the main curve. And the super elevation for this part of the curve is about half a millimetre, about scale for the prototype curve of 18 chains which it equates to at a speed of about 30 miles an hour which would be about right for the approach to what is effectively a terminus station or pulling away from it and going uphill. The curves and cants here are all smoothly transitioned. The super elevation along the inner track is fairly straightforward but it does get more complicated uh, when there is a crossover on the curve as here. There are essentially three ways in which you can deal with the cant through a crossover on a curve. The engineers would always prefer you to put the crossover somewhere else, on a straight bit, so that you didn't have to cant it at all. Another option is to cant each rail, but to leave each at the same height on the track bed. But this results in a rock and roll ride as the cant reverses and then corrects again as you go through the crossover and usually results in a severe speed restriction to boot. So the way it is normally done is to cant the whole crossover as a single unit. The angle through the inner track is continued in the same plane across to the outer track. This has the effect for the outer track that as well as being angled, it also rises on the track bed above the level of the inner track. On the model here, the outer track rises about a millimetre above the level of the inner track at the end of the crossover. The set square here gives a vertical reference. Looking at it from the other end, we can see how the angle of cant is maintained smoothly through the crossover. You don't notice the rise and fall of the train as it joins the outer track. And from the same end of the layout, a view from the slightly higher elevation and more end on to the crossover. This next clip is in just because I like it. John Aldrich's gate set leaning into the curve. Lovely. A point on a super elevated curve presents similar problems to the crossover. The cant is always determined by the main running line through the curve. 
and the superelevation of a track branching from it is subordinate to it. As in the crossover, the angle of cant is maintained across the point, and it is only when the branching track is clear of the crossing nose that it can start its transition back to the flat. So the highest point on this little crossing complex on this curve is about where the brake van is now, still with full cant, but that can now also progressively reduce, so that the point being crossed by the wagons now is on the flat. A final couple of clips as we follow a train around the outer of the double tracks. The cant is evenly maintained as it passes the crossover and the point and you don't notice the rise and fall of about a millimetre as it does so. I'll end with a brief word about how I've done the super elevation on this model. It really couldn't be simpler. Strips of paper laid along the line of the outer rail. If they're four millimetres wide, they extend neatly to the end of the sleepers in two millimetre scale. Standard 80 grams copier paper is about 0.1 millimetre thick. And laminations of this and a thicker 0.2 millimetre artist's paper allows the required height to be built up in 0.1 millimetre steps. With the luxury of the prototypical radii here, I've been able to transition the cant at a rate of about 0.1 millimetre every 2 inches or 50 millimetres. That's an incline of about 1 in 500. Well within the tolerances for our rigid chassis locos and stock. The moulded easy track from the 2 millimetre scale association is a little flexible and to increase its stiffness the track is first laid on a paper template, templated here, and the PVA allowed to set and then the paper is trimmed to the sleeper edges and the whole unit then PVA to the track bed template. When I've remembered I've widened some of the layers to support the middle of the sleepers but this hasn't proved essential. Simple trigonometry will tell you how much to widen it. Incidentally the wobbly marker lines in different colours are just a guide to the height of the cant along the tracks. You do have to plan the super elevation. This shows the super elevation end on. The ruler is horizontal, resting on the outer rails, showing how they are raised about half a millimetre. And this is the effect, the wagon on the left leaning into the curve and the wagon on the right resting on the flat. Super elevation might not be immediately apparent, but it is one of those small features that, when present, adds to the overall illusion of reality.